Ahmad, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. I think actually we may not have had a chance to chat since like a, a COVID project with like Stanford HAI and UN way back in the day. I, I only vaguely way, remember. Yeah, it's way a, back in the day. <laughs> way back when. Yeah. Um, well, it's great, great to great to see you. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to join. So um, I thought we'd do this uh, pretty free form. I think we have about 30 minutes and um, uh, we can also try to get to, to Q&A as well, uh, which we've been doing, but I'll start with, uh, I'll start with a, 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 you know, a pretty, pretty predictable softball or hardball, depending how you look at it, but like, you know, open source versus closed source. What do you, what do you think, what do you think the landscape looks like and, and who wins where? Um, I have thoughts too. I'm happy to volunteer, but want to hear from you first. Yeah, I think it's super interesting because a lot of people have views on this and, you know, you saw that Google memo and other things. Um, I think they're two separate things in a way, because on the one hand, you need open auditable models for all the private data in the world. And so you'll need it for enterprise applications because you need to know how the sausage is made. On the other side, what you've got, and like Bloomberg GPT just now and things like that, you need to know what the data is for financial services, et cetera. All the governments in the world are on open source. On the other side, you have these proprietary models that are black boxes and they're great for consumer applications and certain enterprise applications with dedicated instances and other things. And again, this is where you've seen this technology come first in consumer slash low risk, but eventually it's going to get to enterprise, but only once you've got that sorted. The second part of this is innovation. You know, so stable diffusion gets released and all of a sudden, boom, explosion of innovation, it goes ahead. You get Llama released and then you've seen an explosion of innovation there and now new models that can replace the base because, you know, Facebook, Meta AI does a great job, but yeah, you know, the NC licenses are a bit annoying. Um, but you still are ahead in language models with kind of the likes of OpenAI and others because it requires exponential compute. And when you get up to those levels, you get sunspots and things like that, taking out language model runs. So you've still got a way to catch up. Um, but I don't think it's either or because even if you have the best open source model in the world, you augment that with data and other elements, you'll always have proprietary models that are better. But like I said, I view them as different times, different use cases with some overlap in the middle. We just have generalized models. So that's my view on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 I won't go on too long, but I couldn't agree more with that overview. I mean, I think one one way that I, I've been thinking about it is kind of this, you know, just just really simple, you know, single dimension, just generalist versus specialist. I do think, yes. I, I think if you look at the progress, I mean, I don't know, we have a bunch of involvement with some open source projects. I know you do as <laughs> as well um i think open source is going to give um uh you know some of the closed models a run for their money at, at at all levels of you know all domains all levels but it, i think it's highly likely that for extremely general models uh you know like consumer or 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 uh or web or, you know both because of just the highly general nature of what people like to use them for which actually you get value out of having you know higher capacity and also the flywheels that you can capture if you mm -hmm. kind of you know become the consumer endpoint where they're giving you that that free data and feedback, you know, you might see some of those winning. I think in the enterprise and or anywhere where specialization is necessary, um, you know, if you get to a narrow enough specialization, this is what distillation work recently shows, you can beat yep. a gigantic model with a tiny model. Uh, so, but, and, you know, you can use domain knowledge. So I think it's this kind of spectrum. And I think specialization, you know, increasingly we will, will be built off of open source models plus domain knowledge, like the chat we just had with Gideon pre previously. Generalist, I, I agree. It, it is likely that that will there will be an edge. You know, I don't know if you, if you, if that resonates with kind of how you think about it, but yeah, well, I think this is an artifact of how do these models come about, right? They came about because you have these AGI labs which like stack more layers, you know, <laughs> stack more compute, and all of a sudden you have this exponential of compute with the A100s where you could get almost linear scaling, right, up to you know we've done like. 5,000, 10,000. Um, and that allowed you to create some absolutely crazy models that had emergent capabilities, but they were designed to be generalist. But they turned a bit weird. Um, the way I describe these models are like really talented grads that occasionally go off their meds, you know? Um, and so, because if I fed you the whole of YouTube and made you watch that, you know, you'd turn a bit weird too. So it took six months to turn, you know, give a haircut to GPT-4 and turn it vaguely human through RLHF or whatever they decided to do. Um, because we're feeding it a junk food, like clockwork orange where the uh, you know eyes are strapped open in front of the TV screen. <laughs> that is literally what we're doing with these models. Yeah. So this is why I'm like yeah. upstream, we need to create national data sets and things like that. I'd probably a little more like to survive. But that was the first bulk, and now we're cutting. 
because we don't need all that data. What is the minimum amount of data that you need? So like one of the things we did with stable diffusion recently is we looked at all of the beta data and there were 128 different clusters of images because we had like 100,000 gigabytes of images into like two gigabytes, but only like four of them were actually used. You're like, oh, we could potentially get rid of like 96% of the data in stable diffusion and it could still do that kind of stuff. I think you see similar things in the language models. They said, as you instruct large models from smaller models, but then again, you even seeing labs like OpenAI say, well, what if we move towards more specialized models? Because A, in terms of graduates, nobody likes to know it all, right? Like, come on. Um, but B, I think, again, the parameter is that the OpenAI's anthropics of the world are like hiring from McKinsey. But again, they're still a bit wobbly, whereas open models are hiring your own grads. I think that as you move, though, the design patterns are really boring that most people use now. It's one-to-one. -one. You know, you're just facing that model. Look at Cicero, you have eight different language models working together to outperform humans, you know, at diplomacy. Look at, again, the specialization and you look at things like Frugal GPT, you wanna chain models together with increasing specialization with MOEs. What are the design patterns of the future? And for that, you need a level of controllability. And I think, again, the openness and transparency of being able to see some of these data flows will win over the big specialized things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it's gonna be, AGI giant model versus these small nimble models. The proprietary models themselves have become more nimble. Look at Palm 2. Like we don't have the exact data, but we can infer from the paper that it is a far more efficient model. And again, you look at GPT-4 and you back out some of the inference timing, either they've done some wonders or it's not a gigantic model. It's relatively small. Although it's different on Azure versus OpenAI in terms of responsiveness. So it's like maybe different chips, maybe different models. I don't know. Um, no, it's super interesting. I mean, like all this, we did a study I mentioned in the talk here this morning called data comp. Actually stability was involved too. I, at least I, uh, I'm, I'm revealing how, how involved I was with the logistics. Well, I mean, like data comp was trained on the cluster, <laughs> stability cluster. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. again, I, I, you know, this is all, all the work of, of grad students at UW on, on, uh, uh for, for the, the connection I had, uh, you know, clearly, uh, I, I helped in a huge way, but, um, the cool idea there, again, same thing you said, it's, if you filter and curate the data, you can get even better performance. So I think it's less about just blindly more data, which now a lot of people have been saying, it's more about high quality data. And that actually gets into the next question that I was gonna pose, which is how you, how you define what high quality means when these things have such general emergent uses um, it, it is it seeming to be one of the big challenges. So, you know, for, for for you and the users that that you uh, intersect with, I mean, people are doing all kinds. I mean, intuitively and and just first principles. When you want to shrink something down and specialize it, you need to know what you're specializing for. And I think for enterprise, this is a big challenge, but it's going to be a little bit more straightforward because they can define you know specific business use cases. When you have a generalist model that's being queried by all these users, kind of how do you how do you learn what it should be specialized in? If that question makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an artifact of, you know, the big model training, right? Like how many GPT-3s could you train back when GPT-3 was done was three years ago? My God, you can only train one of them. Whereas now, like, you know, we've got like 10,000 H100s coming. You look at that and you're like, I can train four GPT-3s a day, you know? And that's just mind boggling to see this exponential compute because the way that these models are trained, you know, there is the curriculum learning method again the graduate comparison becomes really good. Like you put it through primary school, then high school, then university, and then you turn it into an accountant, right? Um, and so I think you will see models of different levels of this thing kind of coming through because maybe Code Da Vinci is a good example of that. So uh, GPT 3.5, from what we can see again, what was shared was based on a code model. So they trained a language model for a few epochs, a few runs of the thing, and then they trained a code model for a few epochs. And then they specialized it in various areas. When you could only train one big model, what you had to do was take that latent space. And just like the dream booths and you know all these avatar things, you created an embedding layer or something else on top of that that pointed to a specific thing for a specific use case. But you ignored like 98% of the things. You just had very specific things. As we move forward and we move from research to engineering, we're now having optimization occurring because you don't need all of that PyTorch stuff. You can move more and more specialized and strip out the learning that you don't want. You can make it more and more targeted in terms of curriculum learning to achieve the outcomes you want. And a lot of the stuff doesn't need the gigantic models. 
You can route it through smaller specialized models and then only refer to the larger gigantic model when you have a very general purpose query. Yeah, I think it's an awesome, I mean, uh, you were mentioning some of these uh, uh, examples of kind of combining specialist models or kind of balance, like load balancing almost, as you said, between when do you need a specialist tool, when do you need a generalist one. Uh, Hugging GPT was a paper that came out that I thought was awesome of, you know, uh, which specialist model do you route to? Um, but yeah, it, it, it's an intuitive, uh, I like your metaphor. <laughs> I've, I've used the one of, you know, precocious college student uh, who, uh, you know, often opines about things that they uh, they don't know about versus, you know, highly trained specialist. And, you know, yeah. you know the, the, the former, you know, like like those of us who were one of those and somehow managed to <laughs> stumble into doing some real work eventually, you know, they can be useful, they can be trained, but they're not what you put into the field, uh, you know, at a hospital or, uh, you know, an insurance company or a bank or et cetera. So, you know, this idea, this just this spectrum, and it's, it's going to look really interesting. I think, um, uh, you know, and I think we'll see a lot of like software versioning things of big trees of all the branches and forks kind of, yeah. What, what do you think it looks like in terms of um, just the nitty gritty of how people manage these things? Like, is it going to look kind of converged more like, you know, open source code where you have forks and branches and things like that? Or, Well, I mean, this is what we do at Stability in that, you know, we're probably the only multimodal AI team in the world apart from OpenAI. So we do image, audio, code, 3D, video, protein folding, like everything. Um, and kind of our ambition is to create the default model of every modality, sectoral variants with licensed data and then national variants. So we work with multiple governments to take uh, broadcasting data and others and create national data sets that are standardized. And this is why we fund things like data comp, um, because it's really interesting to understand what is good data. Um, and then you have what I call the hypercube, which is very predictable, and it's available via Amazon Bedrock and many other things in the future as an option. So you can use stability models to know what you're getting, um, because otherwise I think it's just going to be an absolute mess, because uh, you've got a million different things happening all at once, and each has their own latent spaces, and each has their own thing. And it's going to go beyond that, because it's not just transformers, right? So like um, another thing that we funded independent research is RWKV, uh, which is a 14 billion parameter recurrent neural network language model that performs as well as a transformer language model. I mean, like what happens when you have different architectures like that and Hyena and others scaling? It's like, they are all a bit different. And then you probably need an AI to help glue them all together, to be honest. At least we have that technology right now. Uh, because, but it doesn't matter about the technology because ultimately what matters is are you getting the job done in a business sense, right? You have the ingredients, how do you bring them together? And one of the wonderful things I think about this technology is that with classical open source, you have all these dependencies and all this friction moving in and out, right? Whereas like four of the top 10 apps on the app store in December had stable diffusion, a two gigabyte file as their entire backend. You know, like you can build an entire backend on a chat GPT and more and more of these models. Um, and that's just immense power because you can just reference it in different ways. It's a new type of programming primitive. Like I remember when I started programming, I was it 23 years ago. Uh, we had subversion. We didn't have GitHub and like all these kids these days, they have it easy, right? Um, and it's just becoming more and more abstract away. And this is a new type of translation primitive, like a mega codec. And so it'll be really interesting. And again, that's what I'm excited about. What are the design patterns that emerge out of this to enable these outcomes, you know? What does it oh, look super, like as we start chaining them together? It's super exciting. I mean, I, I, maybe I have the slightly lamer uh, um, uh, analogy of a database because I uh, came from some of that area, but I like to think, yeah. you know, think about these things, or it, I don't know how operational this is yet, um, uh, but, you know, thinking about them as a distributed database, right? So what's the equivalent of a query? What's the equivalent of tuning? I was talking about this with, with, with Gideon from yeah. Bloomberg about kind of, you know, the equivalent of uh, database tuning is you're kind of, tuning the mix of queries you're expecting and optimizing for, just like tuning what data you put in, what kind of tasks are you expecting? Uh, so I think there's some cool analogies there, but that or programming primitives, like it's, it's definitely changing how we build software. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's important thinking about what does this do? Because classical big data was, it was easy to get the data in and then the inference costs were massive. You need these massive server farms at Facebook and Google and things like that to target you with your ads or whatever. Whereas with this, we take absolutely gigantic supercomputers. We do all the processing up front, but like, again, stable diffusion was 100,000 gigabytes of images and the output is a two gigabyte file of weights. 
Uh, GPT-4 looks like it fits on two H100s according to NVIDIA. That's like 100 gigabytes. The fact that they can do what they can do as a database is actually amazing. So people talk about hallucinations and I'm like, it's not a hallucination, like, because there's no way you can fit that much knowledge in that amount of stuff. It's learning principles. And you said earlier, the graduate, uh, the, you know, the college student is very confident. This goes to the question of interpretability as well. When you ask it why it does it, it's like a post hoc rationalization. Like, that's kind of why I did it. We don't actually know how these things still work, uh, which is a concern, but they do work. And it's amazing that they do work. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, yeah, the, I mean, with the database analogy, again, the level of compression is insane. That's kind of what we're, what we're all marveling at if you want to distill it down to something. Um, and so, yeah, there are trade-offs to compression, right? The, the interpretability, the, uh, the, the, the just number of bits of factual information you can store. I mean, I'm also not the biggest fan of the term hallucination, partly because of what you said, of, but, but the broader point I think that I'm agreeing with here is just, it makes it sound like this mystical, emergent, unexpected phenomenon when really, you know, we're training these things to say statistically plausible things in response to a prompt and we're giving them, as you said, a very small amount of space in which to store it. It's no surprise that, you know, to be factual or to be accurate on some specific task, you need to either train it to do better on that task explicitly or, and or provide information uh, from some, you know, uh, um, uh, some backend source. So, you know, I, I just call yeah. them apps because you haven't trained it for your task or equipped it for your task yet. Yeah, I mean, we take these great creative AIs and we turn them a bit boring and that's fine, you know? But again, that's why you shouldn't trust the one-on-one -on -one interaction. You should instead think, this is a reasoning engine that understands principles. You've got your type one brain and your type two brain, your very logical brain and your principle-based brain. How do you combine those to get the outcomes that you want? Where do you want to have a bit more flexibility? And so I think as people start thinking about it in that way, they'll build far better experiences to get the job done here. So, so speaking about building, wh where do you, if you had to pick, you know, one or two examples, like where do you think we're, we're most overrating or, or the, there's the most inflated expectations in terms of actual end usage of, of, of these new models? Where do you think we're underappreciating where they're going to actually have bigger impact than people think? Um, Just bringing the question on you, but yeah. Yeah, no, uh, overappreciating. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a, a massive bull on this, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know a single company in the world that won't use these models over the next few years. And that's a lot of companies. And like the biggest impact is going to be regulated industry. A lot of regulation is due to information being lost or no ability to standardize, to customize. So two examples of that are healthcare and education. There's nothing that's been proven as effective in education except for the Bloom Two Sigma effect, which is a one-to-one -one tuition. What if we give an AI tutor to every child in the world? It completely transforms education, massively deflationary. Similarly, healthcare, most of our healthcare teaches us in numbers, whereas we could have individualized healthcare with this technology. And that again would be immense. Um, I think that, again, the expectations are going a bit like this though. Where do you think the most overhype is? Fair enough, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think in, in, general, in the near term, I think there's just a lot of, Overhype. I think the net new, well, I, let me put it this way. I think the net new number of use cases and value that we're going to derive from these models is orders of magnitude what we had than what we had before. I think that's real. Yeah. I think though the like of the total things people think are going to be magically solved, there's only a subset of that in the next couple of years. We're, you know, I, I think there's two areas. Uh, I think the the thing is, it always takes longer and shorter than you expect. So next I'd love year is proven wrong. I mean. <laughs> no, no, I think next year, I don't think we see massive enterprise use till next year, for example, right? Yeah. And then things still take time. 1.5 million people still use AOL, you know, like th these things, like a third of the world still doesn't have internet. Yeah. Cloud so, transformations in the enterprise are still a thing that are, you know, happening right now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like, oh, what about generative AI? And you're like, oh. yeah, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. So I, I, there's, a, there's a pacing of it. And there's, there's the, especially in the enterprise, I think, um, I think an interesting area is these these uh, these co-pilot style applications. I think there's both immense value there because you don't need to have something working at 100% accuracy. You don't even need to know how to measure a proxy for accuracy mm. to get utility out of these. But we've known for many, many years that like 
there's a lot of nuances and gotchas with copilot systems, right? There's the old the old paradigm of, you know, it accelerates the human operator, but it also makes them more complacent at the wheel, yes. so to speak. Uh, and I actually think it's interesting, you know, people are are rightfully just getting really excited about, you know, copilot for code type applications. That's a, we use it at our company. We push people to use it. Like it's a, it's a wonderful new paradigm. Code is interesting though, because while it is a very highly complex, highly paid skill that, you know, it's shocking that AI can help this much in some ways, it also has lots of built-in checks and redundancies. You know, you have yes. compiler checks, you have unit tests, et cetera. So I think Copilot, the copilot paradigm is going to be one of the biggest areas we see value here because it, it has these kind of redundancies of a human in the loop. But I think there are some areas where people are overestimating the kind of last mile. How do you build the UI UX? How do you build the checks? How do you, mm. you know, um, how do you solve that operator complacency problem um, that, that we're still going to have to figure out? So I'm not very bullish on that paradigm. I just think there's some gotchas that people are, are, are ignoring. And then the second area, which this is, you know, shameless plug for what we do, but, and it's not pessimism on these models, it's just, we like to turn foundation model because often they need to be adapted further, whether it's fine tuning, yes. prompting, I think all of those things converge uh, um, uh, to basically just, you need to specify more about what you're trying to do. That's still in my book, optimism, but it's, you know, a little bit, sometimes to pump the brakes, like, Hey, you can't just expect to do a little bit of prompt engineering and have this solve your challenging problem at 99% accuracy, you're going to need to do a little bit more development first. Um, so again, that's more about a, you know, realistic expectations, not negativity. Uh, so I don't know, that's my, my short answer. I don't know if you have reactions to any of that. No, look, I agree with you. Like at the moment, it's like, let's say for image creation, like it took days and then it took seconds. The best images are between, right? And so right now everyone's like quick, 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 but they're not taking the time to think further on a lot of these things. Um, and as you move to retrieval augmented models, you move to some of these other things, I think it changes dramatically. And again, like we're just at the iPhone 2G, 3G moment, but we're at the point where research artifacts are genuinely useful. Are they gonna be useful for everything? It takes time. You know, as you said, code is very bounded. Is it any wonder that computers can talk to computers better than we can talk to computers? Not really. <laughs> You know, um, but then as we move on from that, prompting is hard. My wife has been trying to prompt me for 17 years with no success. You know, like it's a real kind of talent. And so we have to build meta systems around these systems because again, we're just, this never existed before, you know, from an architectural perspective, what are best practices? Um, you know, like people look at vector databases, are they required when you can have instant fine tunes or retrieval augmented models? You know, like what does it actually look like? We're still not sure what the stack is. What will yeah. the generative AI stack be? And the skills around it. I know that's a big the question came up in in the mm -hmm. uh, the talk I gave earlier. Of, you know, what are data sciences going to get unemployed? And, and and I think the answer, just like with every wave, is not if you have the right shift in skills. I think a lot of the things we teach in intro to ML, intro to data science, you know, tweak these knobs and the algorithm and the model architecture are going to become somewhat obsolete in day to day practice. But then there's a whole new set of skills that come up from this whole new set of interfaces. Um, uh, actually, I just noticed the time though. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Feel free to respond. Uh, but but uh, <laughs> um, I, I know there's some Q and A. Um, so if um, I don't know if you have access to the Q and A and you can kind of peruse, I see two questions yeah. here. Matthew may have asked. Yeah. Yeah, got, if the cost of computer hardware is becoming cheaper, 500 parameter versus 5K parameter model. Is a cost saving significant? Uh, where's the most of the cost come from? So I think this is probably a question of like, tune a chat GPT model in like $5,000, you know? <laughs> uh, plus the cost of compute actually dropping as well. Um, so like my, my take on the, yeah, I mean like computers getting cheaper, capabilities are improving. One of the things that always blows my mind is we don't know where the logical limit is on efficiency here. You know, we're still in the GPU age versus the ASIC age, just like Bitcoin. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, what is the minimum amount of data that's required? What is an optimal model size in order to achieve it? How small could ChatGPT be? How fast can it be? I literally don't know, because sometimes we literally see an order of magnitude improvement, which again is crazy to think about. Yeah, I mean, we're still at the basic level of understanding, hey, if I just leave it training for another, another uh, you know, a couple of days, uh, look at what we get out of it. Like, so I agree, we're, we're still probing there. So um, as an example of this, we had um, stable diffusion, it was 200,000 A100 hours. Worsten, which gets the same level that we funded is 9,000 A100 hours. 
200 to nine for the same output. Who knows? It's crazy. Uh, we might have time for one or two more questions. I see uh, a couple here. And then obviously if anyone wants to come live, uh, feel free, but um, I'm gonna leave it to you to, to, to pick. Yeah, uh, what do you think? Is prompt engineering the new coding that new people join the industry should be great at? I think that, um, you know, when, when we were kind of learning, we learned UML, architectural design and other things like that. And it comes all back to information theory, right? Information is valuable in as much as it changes the state. And you need to think about how these technologies and these models influence information flow. You know, and this is where data becomes so important, understanding the data behind it. What does that look like? That's probably the most valuable skill you'll have in this age. Because uh, I think programming individual languages will become easier and easier uh, from that. And then I got a question, when we see music from Stability, and we've got music models coming up, and we just had Peter Gabriel, a AI music video competition. And so we just had the winners from that announced. And so you can see some pretty awesome things. Um, so I'll drop a link to that in the chat. I think people will really enjoy that. That yeah, is it. Yeah. I certainly did. Well, Ahmad, thank you so much for taking the time.